All right. Good morning. Morning. Another Monday morning high five. Thank you for joining us. We are continuing in uh, the book of Judges, chapter eight. This morning we're looking at verses 18 through 28. So I'll start us off with our um, our quick summary. Um, in verse 18, the two kings from the Midianites has been, have been captured, Zeba and Zalmunna, and Gideon questions them about some people they killed at Tabor. And he says, where are the men whom you killed at Tabor? And they answered him, well, I mean, honestly, they look like you. They, they all resembled the son of a king. And Gideon tells them, you killed my brothers. Those were my mother's sons. Um, and now if you had left them alive, I wouldn't kill you. But now it's revenge. <laughs> it's, it's personal. <laughs> and so um, he tells his firstborn son to kill the two kings. But because the son is very young, he's afraid. And the two kings tell him, I mean, just kill us yourself. You know, like you, you've done all this, like you're strong enough to do it. Just go ahead and kill us yourself. And so Gideon does, he gets his sword, he kills the two kings. Um, and then he takes the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Um, the men of Israel come to him. They try and make him king or convince him, you should rule over us. And not just you, but you're, the rest of your family should be rulers. Like they should be kings. And Gideon tells them, no, no, that's we're not going to do that. But here's what we can do. Um, as a reward for, you know, all the victory I was able to secure, you can each give me part of the spoil. And so the Midianites, it, uh, apparently there's the Midianites and the Ishmaelites who were very closely related. Like biologically, they were cousins. They were all sons of Abraham. All, all three of them are sons of Abraham. Um, the Israelites are obviously Abraham's sons from Sarah. The Midianites are Abraham's son from Keturah, and the Ishmaelites are Abraham's sons from Hagar. All of them are related, right? Um, and so he tells them the Ishmaelites, they were known for wearing golden earrings. Each one of you give me one of those earrings. And he collects this voluntary giving of this gold to him. It says 1,700, I believe I saw one, um, and like the, a lot of just spoil, a lot of, a lot of um, the things that they had taken from the men that they defeated. And he uses this gold and some of the, the very valuable things that he receives to make an ephod. And an ephod was, um, it was something that the priest would wear. It was this object that the priest would wear. And why Gideon makes an ephod? Oh, only, only Gideon knows. He wasn't, that was not, that was something for a priestly line. Gideon's line was not priestly. He was never intended to be a priest. Um, but he makes this ephod, and the Bible tells us um, Israel whored after it, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. But then it also lets us know that Midian was not was no longer a problem for Israel, and the land had rest forty years as long as Gideon was living. So that's the the quick, dirty version of uh, eighteen through twenty eight. Richard, what do you see? Um, first thing I saw in there was uh, verse 22, where it says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, 
rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And just people have this tendency, they have this way of wanting like to put people over them. Um, so at this time, after Gideon taking out the Midian, the Midianites and the leaders, he seems like the most powerful man because they just had a powerful oppressor oppressing them. Right. And now for Gideon to take out that powerful entity that was oppressing them, now it, it becomes of wanting to like replace. So, all right, so you did, you took out what was over us. So now you can go into that slot. You can, <laughs> you, you should, you should rule over us. Right. Like they did it wrong, but we know you and you're going to do it right. So we want you over us. And it, it's just people have that tendency to want to place people over them. Um, I was listening to this one producer and he was talking and he was talking about how, you know, we have a tendency to put people like in the spotlight. And, you know, because we we see one part of them and then we like them. And so we now we want to put them in the spotlight. But anything you put in the spotlight, you start to see spots like you'll start to notice things and see things that are, you know, not what you would think or not what you thought. Right. Um, you know, in the church, we sometimes members have a tendency to to put the pastor in that role of, you know, wanting the pastor to rule over them and putting them in that spotlight. But when you do that, you're going to start to see spots and you're like, wait, they're not perfect. No, they're they're not perfect. They're human, just like you know, just like you. Right. Um, and so it's just you know we're seeing that you know way back in the book of Judges how you know they want uh, it even goes further back to the book of Genesis. Um, seeing <laughs> people want to put other people you know over them to rule, um, and and kind of run and protect them. Uh, but Gideon has enough sense, and I think that's because of his his tests and his, you know, interactions with God to know that no, like that. First of all, the it wasn't me; it was God who gave you know us that victory, because I wouldn't have done it like that. That had I had nothing to do with that. We didn't even really fight for half of them. They started killing themselves. Like right. it was all God, and He said, you know, no, I'm not going to rule over you, but the Lord will rule over you. Right. Um, and so just that that should be the answer when people try to push us or push other people into that position. Like it's no, I'm it's God who's going to rule over you. It's it's not me. Um, but yeah, just just that verse, you know, stood out to me. Yeah. And I, I as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, for the people. And always remembering like the context of judges that everyone is doing what seems right to them. It would seem right. Like, yeah, let's make Gideon king. Like God, you know, on, on one level or another, God is working with him. God is talking to him. Hey, let's make him the king. Like, he, <laughs> it seems like he'd be a great choice to be king, you know? Right. Like he said, not just the strongest, but I mean, he, he seems like, you know, he's in line with what God is once God has given him victory, like he sh he should be the king. Yeah. But that just because that made sense to them doesn't mean that it was what God wanted. And so right. um one of the things I was looking at, uh the tail end of, of verse 21, where it talks about the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of the camels of the Midianites, the Midianites, the Ishmaelites. Again, they're very closely related. Um, the Midianites were more um, a nation, which is why I think you see the focus on Midian because they were more of a nation. Um, mm -hmm. And from the, the commentaries and, and things that I studied, it seems like the Ishmaelites are more just a people. They're more nomadic. They they didn't necessarily have a territory. They lived very closely with the Midianites, were, you know, interrelated with them. Um, but we see this crescent ornament. And if you look even today, one of the symbols of 
the Islamic faith or the Muslim faith is the crescent moon. And it's not to suggest that these, you know, the Midianite kings were following, you know, Islam or anything like that. But it's it's just interesting to see, like, even today, like, the Islamic faith is considered to be or, or to have started from the Ishmaelite line. Like that was how it came to be. And so it's just interesting to see like these very real pieces of history, these very real pieces of what we kind of know about history, that it lines up with the Bible. It lines up with um god with with who if anyone would know it would be god <laughs> so <laughs> you know it's just it's when people try and suggest that oh i mean how do we even know these things happen how do we know these stories aren't just stories well because you can tr like it rings true like when you trace it back it's like yeah no you check off that box yeah that's that's what yeah. we see today you know like we see this worship of the crescent moon. It was a sign of worship of, it, and this goes back even before the Ishmaelites, I believe, you know, like it's this worship of the moon, of, um, of there were always these different idols. And then mm -hmm. when you fast forward, you, you look at um, Gideon making this ephod, which becomes another idol like this was not something that that god gave him to do it's something right. that he thought was it made sense it seemed like a good idea he does it but it becomes another idol and so he from their idol he creates another idol <laughs> as if it's better you know and and again it's all about this context of people doing what they think is right. That like you can't escape it in the book of Judges. People are doing what they think is right. Yeah. And it's and it's it's that I'm doing what what makes sense to me that really creates this cycle. It mm. it really adds to okay, yeah, look, the land had rest 40 years and as soon as Gideon dies back into trouble like back into i mean even like you can see like gideon gives them victory over midian the people but he doesn't give them victory over the idol worship like that's yeah. the continual problem like that's why they keep falling victim to these other nations because they it, it just seems right it just it they don't see the the spiritual harm the spiritual harm in worshiping other gods they don't see they don't i guess they make the connection but they just after a while after some you know a couple years of peace it's like i mean we could i think we could start dabbling again right we could <laughs> we could go back to to Baal and you know we could yeah. I mean, okay, look, here's what we'll do. We won't worship him on the Sabbath, okay? That would just be disrespectful. We'll worship him, like, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays, but on yeah. the Sabbath, we will not right now worship Baal. We'll we'll work our way into that, okay? Maybe uh, we'll work our way up to worship him on the Sabbath, but right now, he's just respect, restricted to Monday, um, you know, Monday comes from Moon Day, anyways. Yeah, we'll just we'll just we'll mix and match. It makes sense, right? It makes sense. It's not, you know, completely disrespectful. No Sabbath right now, okay? Right. No Sabbath worship of Baal. But you know, if you want to do it on Monday, that's fine. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, as much as you look at a passage like this and you just go, I mean, I don't see how that's still relevant. Like, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very relevant. Anytime we are found to be doing what makes sense to us, mm -hmm. what we think is right. We yeah. we're, we're, we're right. 
we're in the the perfect spot to fall into a situation where now some God is going to allow something or someone to get victory over us to get our attention back. Like, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, okay, that that thing that you've you know put prioritized over me. Like, okay, let it save you. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Here comes trouble. Let that thing save you. Let that idol save you. Go ahead. Right. Call on it. Call yeah. on it. I want to see it work. I want to see how valuable it is. So, All right. The, the thing that you created, let it, let it save you. Right. You built. You know. Right. And when you go forward, you see like God continually speaks through the prophets to tell the people like. You know, you you create these gods that have eyes and they can't see you. They have arms. They can't reach out and, and rescue you. They can't hold you. They can't yet. They can't do anything for you. Right. And yet you keep forsaking the one who does see you, who can hold you, who can rescue you for what you create that can't help you. I. I. I always think about how, uh, I don't know if you heard the story, dad always tells about, um, I believe it was, I think he said it was Dionne Warwick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she had, yeah, at the airport, she had, you know, her statue, uh, this idol, um, this, you know, well, I don't know if she would have considered it her God, but it was her statue, you know? And something happens that I guess it had to come out of the bag and for the search. And while it was out of the bag, the statue falls and falls on the ground and breaks. And dad is just laughing like you have to pick up your God that <laughs> fell on the floor on the floor and broke. You have to pick him up and try and put him back together again. And right. I mean, that's that's throughout the Bible. Like God continually, like it was always your God. You have to help your God. When trouble comes, you have to take your God to safety. Your God isn't taking you to safety. Like you, you have to help your God. And so, yeah, just it's something for us to, to recognize. It's something for us to see. It's still relevant today. Anything and anyone that we prioritize over him at a certain point now, it's like, okay, well, yeah, let that save you then, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, anything else, Rich? No, that's pretty much it for me. Okay, yeah, you could hear that people are waking up over here, so we should, <laughs> we'll go ahead and call it a Monday. All right. All right, we'll see you all next Monday if the Lord says the same. We thank you for joining us. Uh, definitely leave your comments. Tell us what you think, what you see in the scripture below, Absolutely. and we'll comment and uh, and respond to it. Yep. Have a great Monday, everyone.